Hello, I'm Gordon Buchanan and welcome to Beneath the Beabub, the Communities and Conservation Podcast from JAMA International. In this second series, we're exploring the real life costs for communities living with wildlife. And in this episode, we move to Botswana to discover how innovative methods and the role of organizations are aiding the coexistence between people and wildlife. The community I visited in the Chobe Enclave was an inspiring site with homes and farming spread out over a wide location just above the floodplain. And whilst there's everything from a craft center to glamping for tourists, local people also have to contend with the nearby Chobe National Park, home to a huge number of wild species. The community is able to benefit from the tourist economy, but the nearby wildlife can also cause life-changing, sometimes devastating challenges, both to the residents' pockets and to their families. Join me alongside the people at the very heart of the matter, beneath the baobab. This is the Chobe Enclave in Botswana. I've come to this cattle post to meet Mr. Moenzi, who is a community leader, he's a, he's a chief, he's also a, a cattle rancher. Um, I've come to find out, I suppose, about the, the views of the local community, but also the challenges for the, that community uh, and the challenges in raising cattle in a, an area like this, but also to hear Mr. Wenzi's own personal stories of, of human wildlife conflict. He's had a couple of episodes in his life that have had um, devastating, um, a devastating impact on the lives of him and his family. Mr. Moesi, thank you very much for having me here at your cattle post. Can we go over and have a look at your cows? Could you explain, I suppose, the geography? I'm looking out, we've got the flood, flood plains off to the right, of up over that ridge, I know that there's a forest. Could you explain a little bit about this, this landscape and surrounding area? We call this place Kavimba. And this Kavimba originates, the name Kavimba is grown from a certain tree, mm-hmm. yeah, which when we first settled here, uh, it was just a, sh- a shrubby of uh-huh. those trees called Kavimba. So this is where the name comes from. And uh, as you can see, well, in the, in the early, days, early years when we came here from 48, 51, it wasn't so scaped as it is mm-hmm. now. Uh, now because of uh, drainage, this uh, it has cost and this drought and also the movement of cattle on where and also some improvements as you can see the roads mm-hmm. and, uh, well because when doing such things the one would need to a level of the area mm-hmm. so it has created a lot of escaping so it's so sloppy but in those days it wasn't as sloppy as it is now yeah i was looking out over the the plains and you could see impala and there was zebra we've seen buffalo crossing elephants sort of in this this area so i suppose this human community is is in a very wild place surrounded by wild animals and there's obviously challenges that, that come with that um, when it comes to sort of owning owning cattle what's the sort of I suppose what's the number one threat from from wildlife yeah when coming to raising cattle especially as you see now especially when it is drought so drought the movement of wildlife is so much mm-hmm. and so uh, there's a lot of threat to wildlife attacks mm-hmm. well I think cattle raising is a it's like a global concern in North America in Europe in in Africa people animal husbandry or cattle is something that people say yeah I understand that but there are I suppose unique challenges mm-hmm. here because you're sharing this landscape with some potentially very dangerous animals yeah, elephants buffaloes yeah. lions so what are the 
I suppose, what are the negatives of living alongside those animals? What are the sort of the worst things that can that can happen? It's not only some attacks, but because with, with those animals, some of them, they bring some diseases, mm -hmm. yeah, which uh, if they will not feel so much uh, in contact between, between the livestock and the, those animals, we couldn't experience such kind of diseases like foot and mouth and so forth. Yeah. And uh, can you explain why you will have animals moving through this area? Because I think a lot of people think, okay, you've got a national park here. Why do, why do the animals not just stay there? It's, it's a protected area. Why is there this movement of different species right through the human community? Well, uh, I think uh, so through this, this establishment of uh, national parks and also this uh, wrapping the creation of these tourists, which uh, of course before that, until those animals, we, especially we, when we saw an, uh, an elephant or a wild animal, we could either shoot or just bang something like a gun mm -hmm. or a stick. Cock, cock, cock. Then those animals get scared. Yeah. Now with the uh, coming in of these tourists, now when they saw, when they see a vehicle with people inside, in the first day they used to run away. Now I work because they, they take some photos and they do no harm, they do no uh, threats to them. Now they also think like this. Mm -hmm. yeah, they also have some sense. Now they've come to realize that oh, these people are not dangerous to us. Mm -hmm. So we can uh, interact, we can live together. Yeah. Though they cannot talk, but we believe that is just uh, being born in their minds. Yeah. So I suppose in many ways, people and wildlife, they're not just sharing physical space, they're sharing resources. There's grazing, there's water here. Yes. Water and grazing that communities need water and grazing that some species yeah. have. When it, when it comes to the animals in this area, which, which, which is the most problematic? Um, when it comes to human wildlife conflict, um, is there one species that, that poses more problems than, than others? When we talk of uh, wild and what's wildlife animals, we don't of, we don't talk of only one species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we, may, we talk of many species, different species. We've got a uh, lion, we've got an elephant, we've got a buffalo. And today we are even experience a lot of problems with the baboons, which you, in the past they were our friends. Mm -hmm. We didn't know they have, they have got some problem. Now as time goes, we don't know whether it's drought or what. Now especially when you talk of conflict now between animals and, and we people, it pains me very much because I'm one of the people who experienced that heartfelt uh, conflict uh, problem brought by an animal, which is a, a buffalo. Mm -hmm. Yes, my sister. I lost my sister uh, in 2019. Yeah, my real sister, mm -hmm. my elder sister. And the unfortunate part of it, uh, we were five in our family. Now all those the, the three had gone, and we were left being two, I and her. Mm -hmm. And then on the, in August 2019, on the 19th of August, I lost her through uh, this buffalo attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm so sorry to hear, yeah. hear that. That's yeah. just, I think, yeah. something that's hard for people to yes, understand and yes, imagine. It really pains me. Yeah. And also, not only that, and again, uh, in 2020, still on in this month of August, on the 31st of August, I lost my firstborn through uh, this elephant uh, colliding with his vehicle. No. Yes, hitting. 
Yeah. So it is very painful. Yeah. Yeah. For for you and your family, and and I suppose the wider community, are there um, are there solutions that you see in in place that are that are helping protect people and uh, helping avoid conflict in whichever form it, it comes. With the people, I think with the education also is plays a part mm -hmm. because the education uh, without that knowledge of how one should take care and how should you uh, be alert when you are moving uh, in order to avoid meeting mm -hmm. such kind of instance. I think they play or they also play much part. part. Yeah. Yeah. And also the patrolling of these uh, wildlife mm -hmm. officers also is is another measure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it seems that um the animals have to learn to live alongside people and people have to learn to live alongside those wild animals, and I hope that as time goes on, um, that those measures and sort of solutions are um, are felt and realised. And I think total harmony and sort of total peaceful coexistence is maybe never going to be achievable because there's always those situations when something yeah. can go yeah. can go exactly. wrong. Yeah. But I just hope from you know through education through sort of assistance and protecting yeah. livestock and, and crops that it can make a it can make a difference. Yeah. Um talking to Mr. Moise, you, you get the sense that there are normal days when people could just go about their lives and about their business and nothing um out of the ordinary happens and then there are days where people's worlds can fall apart and for Mr. Moise he lost his remaining sister a buffalo attack. A couple of years later, he loses his son. So there's the loss of livestock and loss of crops is, is one thing, but I think this, sort of, this is an account of the most extreme example of, of human wildlife conflict. It doesn't get any more um, devastating when you lose, when people lose their, their lives. Um, and I think that's why I sort of, why I've come here is to sort of just to hear the people's voices and pe hear people's stories and to sort of realize that um, these are really profound challenges. Living alongside side wildlife is not easy. There are easy days, but there are some really difficult moments in people's lives brought about by animals and people sharing the, the same space. But it's always against, it seems that there's against this backdrop of, of hope and this sort of move towards coexistence. There is still hope and that people feel that, that coexistence can work. So I'm just approaching this uh, compound and I've come to the right place. It says on one wall, it says Sect, C-E-C-T. It's the Chobe Enclave Community Trust. On the other side, it says CBNRM, which is Community Based Natural Resource Management. Um, I've come here to meet Moses Sinchembe, who's the manager of this trust. He is a representative of this community. He's the spokesperson. I suppose the amplifier um, of the views of the families and the communities in this area. Good oh, to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thank My you name is Moses. I'm Gordon. Thank you. Thanks for taking time. Pleasure is mine. I'm particularly interested in your perspective because you are you have this role which is very important with the trust, but you're from this community. Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm from I'm from Sato, okay. which is not far away from here, um, within the Chobe Enclave uh, uh, community. I was born there. I grew up there, so I'm I'm very much informed about um, uh, the dynamics mm -hmm. of of the area. So all the complications uh, therein, the human wildlife issues, I'm very much um, uh, acquainted to. Yeah. So they they are not new. I see them on daily basis. Yeah, I can imagine sort of you wouldn't have to come from 
too far away where you just don't have that perspective that's really important and I suppose the understanding of the people that you represent, sort of the communities and the families because sort of it's, I suppose it's their voices that you're, you're echoing or you're amplifying. Yeah, which works uh, very well for me, added advantage for me. Um, uh, when you talk about, and not necessarily just talk, but breathe the same things that your people breathe. So it makes my job quite very, very easy. Uh, when you talk about these uh, complications or complexes mm. that comes uh, along or in line with the issues of conservation, human wildlife conflict, mm -hmm. yeah. And is is human wildlife conflict the most pressing of issues, the biggest challenges? Just having spent a couple of days here, yeah. you realise that this is an incredibly special place because you have got these amazing communities yeah. and you have this amazing wildlife yeah. and you could be walking down the road and there's, you see people and then you see this phenomenal mm. wildlife. So it'd be interesting to sort of know what those challenge are, challenges are when it comes to human wildlife conflict. Yeah, a blessing, but equally uh, um, can be termed a case as well. But um, it's more of a blessing to live with these animals. At the moment, we are preaching Yes, it's tough, but we talk to our people about coexistence mm -hmm. because, to be um, fair and honest with you, um, we found these animals here. We found them here. And uh, it is important, therefore, being, have, having been given um, the supreme mandate from the Creator uh, to, uh, to be, we were given the dominance uh, to, <laughs> to take care of these animals. So, um, therefore, yes. Uh, we need to coexist. We need to understand that they're just part of us and we are part of them. Mm -hmm. And who can manage better? Is it them managing us or us managing uh, them? Mm -hmm. I believe it's us to manage these animals um, sustainably. And I, I believe the Chobe Enclave community have done unbelievable when it comes to um, management these species, of these species. What, what are the, the best solutions that you've seen to, of, that to, to try and limit the conflict that, that comes with that desire to have, have coexistence or peaceful coexistence? For me, um, it is not very complicated. And I'm saying so because um, a human being uh, has the capacity to evolve in any situation. So, yes, we understand uh, the dangers of, of living with these animals. But certainly, we just have to understand them better. If you know them, you understand um, uh, the trends. What times? Where do they go at what time? So it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's, an, it's, an, it's just important that you understand these animals. If you know their behaviors, you are likely to survive uh, within them. And I'll give you an example. And hopefully as you, as you were driving along, uh, from, you know, on our roads. We are able to see these animals um, interacting with ourselves. And we are saying, we understand and we know them. We know their behaviors. So that way, we will be able to coexist. Understand these animals. Know them better. Study their behaviors. Because after all, they're also smart. They understand us. Or they can also study us. So coexistence means some tolerance. Mm -hmm the animals and ourselves. Mm. Let's know each other. Yeah. It's not just people learning from the animals, sort of in a world where animals are sharing the, yeah. you know, the space with yeah. people, they're learning in their own way, they're learning from us and how we behave around them. Definitely, 100%. You know, uh, um, they have a language that we may not understand. But if you study them carefully, you will know that this animal is saying to me, you are getting too close. Or I'm comfortable with you, get closer to me. So we have survived, our parents have survived all these years understanding these animals, coexisting with, the, with these animals. Without that, certainly, one way or another, uh, we are going to see or, or, or take them as enemies or them taking us as their enemies. So we have all the capacity to live with these animals through understanding one another.
I spent most of the day up near the, the main road, which is between the floodplain and the national park itself. We've dropped right down at the very end of the day to the floodplain itself. Earlier on, this was full of wild animals. There were warthogs, there were um, some zebra, intermingled with, with cows. So when it comes to sort of the human world and the world of wildlife overlapping, this is, this is what we're, we're talking about. I'm joined by LT, thank you LT. Um, LT works with Nkongo, um, which is a Botswana-based organisation. Tell me what the overarching kind of goals of Nkongo is. Uh, it is uh, an, a community-based uh, capacity building organisation that is uh, based in Mau. So it is a capacity building organisation, also an umbrella body uh, for NGOs and also community-based organization, mainly in the district of Ngamilen, mm -hmm. has the name Ngamilen Council of NGOs. But under that umbrella of, of community-based natural resource management, so natural resources comes in many forms, but one form is wild, wild animals, that is a natural resource. And under that is, is human-wildlife conflict the trickiest or the most challenging issue at the moment for communities like this and communities where there you know there is that sort of two worlds colliding sort of world of wildlife and the world of the human human world well um the whole entire system or the whole entire concept of cbnrm is built on the um on the foundation that the community take care of the wildlife and then the wildlife should benefit the community. Mm -hmm. But now when the wildlife now becomes a problem to the community and set the community back instead of benefiting mm -hmm. the community, now it collapses the overall um, concept of CVNRM. That means that the human wildlife conflict is the biggest threat to the concept of CVNRM. It is how the community now perceive wildlife. They do see this as a benefit. They see it as something that is actually setting me back in life. And then probably I need to kill it. Mm -hmm. Which it's, uh, it is surprising because most of the communities they have actually uh, never said, no, you know what, mm -hmm. I think we should annihilate the whole entire population. Communities still see that this might be or is a benefit mm -hmm. to me. As, at individual levels. And I'm not saying just that because we work with community trust and I'm trying to picture uh, that kind of... They still want a way that they can coexist, mm -hmm. which might be difficult because of things like uh, climate change, things like um, an increase that we have seen in, in wildlife numbers, especially here in Botswana. Yeah. So it's, it's difficult, but communities I see they still want that amicable uh, solutions that could be posed. And we have seen that because, like we said, we have a good relationship with the government. And we have actually engaged in the government workshops and government national strategy to actually try to also give our input because one community might say, okay, the solution are this. And another community might say the solution are this. And having the privilege of actually seeing all of these voices and actually trying to uh, present it to to government mm -hmm. because uh, we have been into panel discussion discussing the very same issue because the government is also seeing that there is a problem of human wildlife mm. conflict. Across making this season of the podcast, I've been fascinated. It's been really uplifting to to hear from people that don't just want to see some financial benefit from wildlife. There's this sort of, I suppose, cultural and traditional sort of value in people's, in people's hearts for wildlife. Because I thought this was all going to be about, well, if we're going to have to share our land or this space with elephants, buffaloes, lions, hyenas, any animal that's going to be a threat to our livelihood, 
we want some kind of compensation but i've spoken to lots of people it's not it's not about it's not about that it is about this desire to to live in harmony if possible and to have this peaceful coexistence and when there are these sort of conflict areas and events is is trying to sort that out and keep moving forward so that people and wildlife can can share the space um wildlife represent a lot of our values in our 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 tradition in our culture so uh, where I grew up, there's not a lot of wildlife there's in this part of it. But what I've seen and I've been amazed is that the people are very proud of their culture mm. and tradition. And there will be no culture and tradition without wildlife. It plays a big role in those. Even giving an example, when a chief is, uh, is put into power, mm -hmm. it used to be an uh, alliance uh, has to hide, has to be based upon to say you are the chief of that's a big part of the tradition and culture of it. And we are very proud of it. So if we are proud of that and we don't showcase it, because you hear a lot of trust, uh, having ambition to say, you know what, we want a cultural village. So that uh, people who come into our our concession or who come into our life they need to know and you need to understand how we 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 live. Now you can all, always have the tradition, but you also need your livelihood. Mm -hmm. So to them, it also means livelihood. The way they lived it with that, and uh, the way they live it is culture, livelihood. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. You can have uh, culture without livelihood, without wildlife. All of them, they are all connected. So they don't. They don't hate it, and they don't just want financial. Mm -hmm. They want amicable solution for coexistence. Yeah. And, and in the best case scenario, this 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 model of community based natural resource management, of sort of just community in, involvement, um, and these community trusts being set up. What sort of give me the top three benefits? to communities that are quite reflective across sort of all of Southern Africa, how people can benefit from living alongside wildlife. The, the community-based nature of Syrian Arab, in short, is, um, allows for there to be entities, the community-based organization, which is then in some trust, they're given a concession. So a concession is sort of like they're given a large piece of land near the, the, the protected area and it's full of wildlife. So you, you're given user rights to actually use those, uh, that, that uh, concession, that piece of land with a lot of wildlife. So some will be given quotas, quotas to say, okay, now you can hunt uh, five elephants or ten elephants, which are quite worth a lot. Some will be given, will, will just not be given the, the quotas, depending on the life, uh, the quotas are depending on the uh, uh, life popula wildlife populations and other factors that uh, regard when you are giving out quotas. So those ones that are not given quotas, they also have wildlife. They, they can rent it out, most of them they do rent out their concession, to safari operators or tourist operators. And you, if you have those tourist operators giving the, cons, the, the, the giving the, the, the communities through the community trust some, uh, some rental fees or concession fees as their community loan. Then some, they even go into uh, business negotiations to say, no, we'll set up our own campsite or our own lodge. That money goes to the bank or the bank account belonging to the trust. And we're taking some quite uh, amount of money. After the, uh, the quite a, so many projects are they're now uh, built on that. Sometimes now there's a mixed messages that people get, no, I want to be given money into my own pocket, which some do. 
they actually have the household uh, household uh, money that are given. Uh, I'm not sure if it's annually or not, but uh, they do benefit. And the, all of this money comes from mm -hmm. the concession, having the concession. Yeah. And that's the entire CBNRM. And don't get me wrong, there's the, the, some uh, improvements and some gaps that need to be addressed. Uh, capacity yeah. may be one of them. And we, we as in Congo, we, we try to address this, you know, those kind of um, among other issues. Yeah. And human wildlife conflict is one issue that we are trying because uh, if the community is not on board because they are seeing the human wildlife conflict uh, affecting them, it just draws back on the on the system itself. But it's what I can say, it's, it's a work in progress and we think uh, that through that it can actually go even further and mm -hmm. make these communities more developed than they are because they have what we do call a diamond, yeah. sitting there and waiting to be harvested and, yeah. and more money. It's not all about the money, but uh, it's a huge part yeah. of livelihood. Wildlife is, is a natural asset and in a concession high in, in wildlife, there's no getting away from it. The presence of that, those animals can generate money, whether it's from hunting, whether it's from tourism, and what I'm seeing is that money that is coming in purely because of the presence of wildlife is spread through the community, sort of into people's pockets through jobs being provided, but into the community providing house, um, providing schools, house, houses for our care for the elderly, um, health care, and all of the things that every community and every society needs but it's sort of it's kind of funded by the presence of, of wildlife which is you know that is i suppose the only really op real option sort of to have human people and wildlife sharing the same space there has to be this sort of um this, this benefit that i suppose it does go beyond the the cultural benefit and the traditional um benefits of having wildlife there um I think people just generally think that tourism, the money just comes in and goes into one person's pocket. And that's not the case. It is sort of, you know, as you sort of in your work, as I've seen, that money is sort of, yeah, just diluted. It's like the flood coming here. <laughs> Falls as rain and this place just fills up and spreads and it's sort of the benefits of, of that are felt by, you know, lots of members of the community. Like I said, there's a lot of uh, gaps, um, room for, in, for improvement. But um, one of the biggest gaps is that the, the community trust and their, uh, their good work is hardly ever publicized. Mm -hmm. There's little visibility on issues. Um, so it's one of the capacity issues that we were talking about, that the trust could be doing all of these good things. Mm. But they don't publicize it. And so that's where we feel like if we can get enough, because we also have challenges in trying to reach the whole, the whole community, because we are not only based on uh, conservation and livelihoods, there are other sectors that also we deal with, uh, such as health on the side and others that we we are limited in resources in actually get, reaching all of the trust and getting them um, to have now a, the full capacity to say, okay, all over the world, here is what we are doing and here is how the communities benefit and here is the story mm -hmm. of Botswana. Yeah. This is how things are. So if you are going to do an international policy that is going to affect us, but being not mindful that this is how we run our things, this is how the CBNRM is built. So if you do this, it, look at it how it may affect the entire system that we have created for ourselves. Yeah. Mabuso Kakambi was born and raised in Kavimba village, not far from here, as a child through her teens. Until six years ago, living alongside nature was a, a dangerous 
prospect. It was a negative presence. All of that has changed, so I'm on my way to meet her to find out how and why. Can you just tell me about um, your role within within Wild Crew, and and I suppose why I suppose for someone in an organisation like Wild Crew, why it's important to have local people involved at sort of the level that you're at. So my role is to make sure to raise awareness, to go into the schools, into the community, to host uh, meetings. Uh, we attend meetings representing the organization to raise awareness on these issues of human wildlife conflict, whereby, like I said yesterday, that I never liked these wild animals. Growing up as a kid, I never liked these wild animals because I grew up with that negative mind that I've been hearing from the families, from the uh, friends, that these wild animals are very dangerous. I never saw the positive outcome out mm -hmm. of it. But now after joining Wild Crew as a community education officer, I'm the one now teaching my own community how to conserve and the benefits that we get from these wild animals, mm -hmm. not seeing the bad parts of them. Yes, I know sometimes they're not good, but at least now it's like my eyes have opened. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's an interesting point, saying that your eyes have, have opened, because I think it'd be quite easy, it's, especially for outside organisations or even maybe sort of um, a political level is there's always people saying okay this is this is how you're supposed to to feel um, this is how you're supposed to behave in these situations whereas I suppose if you've had the yeah a kind of revelation um, that you know you suddenly have gone from seeing wildlife as a, as a danger as a yeah. negative to have sort of transition into this sort of you know realization that they, it is there are benefits benefits to the the community um you know, what, what do you say to somebody that says okay there's no ben that maybe hasn't thought about it someone yeah. that's sort of raised in this area said no there's no benefit it's only problems that come from wild animals what are the sort of the, the sort of top lines that you say to people it's about knowledge i will respect their views but it's all about knowledge. That's why I said uh, most of my job here in the community is to raise awareness, is to teach them that uh, it's not only danger that we see or comes from these wild mm -hmm. animals. I believe it's knowledge. It's all about knowledge. So that's why they say knowledge is power. Mm -hmm. So if you've got knowledge about something, yes, of course, you might end up saying, oh, I didn't know. I used to think like that, but now I'm thinking mm -hmm. like this. It's all about knowledge, raising awareness. So that's why most of the time I'm always here. I'm based here on the enclave. So I'm working under all these five villages from Mabele to Parakarungu, the last village. So that's my job, that's my role, to make sure that the community understands. Yeah, I suppose in its most simple terms, it's about communities realising that their lives are enriched by wildlife and not endangered. But I suppose when it comes to human-wildlife conflict, yeah. um, it's about trying to sort of mitigate and trying to sort of limit the, the harm that some wildlife can do. Is that this human wildlife conflict, is that the sort of the biggest the biggest issue for you? Yeah, it's sort of, yeah, the big you, when you talk of human wildlife conflict, it's a hot topic. It's not an easy one to talk to the community. I still remember the first time when we started talking about these conflicts and Predators, uh, elephants, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy. Especially I'm from this community. They will ask you, what is it that you know? We were born here. You are just a small girl. What is it that you are trying to teach us? We know these wild animals, they are very dangerous. So it takes time for them to gain your trust. Like when we first started, six months down the line, we were on the ground. We started by building the mobile bombers. Then after a year, that's when we started constructing the, the predator-proof crowds. But now they are seeing the benefits that even if Matabanelo, this cattle post that we are in now, it was one of the hotspot areas, one of the hotspot areas in the Chobe enclave. But ever since we started building these crawls here, in this area we've got about six of them. 
So now these uh, animals, because they are smart enough, they learn over time. They know that even if I go there, I cross there. These cows, they won't do anything. Mm -hmm. They won't break the, 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 the crawl and go out. No, they know that even if I go there, there's no easy meat there. Mm -hmm. So they target those ones that are weak, like the traditional cross. Um, so in the schools, in, in the communities in this area, I'm always sort of interested to sort of see the, the evolution of this relation, relationship. Um, and the education side of it is, is so important. And people say that all the time, education is so important. Yeah. But in a situation like this, it, it, ever more so about you know, finding the best way forward and it is a, it's sort of uplifting to know that there are children in schools that are you know seeing the benefits you know from from their free education yeah. from living alongside wildlife what what does the so you've been with wild crew for six years what does the what does the future look like for you long term 15 20 years what would you like to to see happen if you talk about predation or coexistence they feel like it's like it's a hot topic that never coexisted before. But if you sit them down to say, look, our grandfathers lived with these wild animals. That coexistence. Mm -hmm. That's coexistence. This is what we are talking of now. These wild animals, yes, they used to come, but not regularly like now. So this is what we are saying now. This is what the government is encouraging. Let's live with these wild animals. Let's coexist. You see, the forest is on the other side there, they're up there, and the river is, so we are sharing the resources. So these wild animals, they have to pass through the village to access the water. So we have to coexist. There's nothing that we can do. They lived here before, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, I suppose the ideal is that people in the future, people of all ages will see elephants crossing the road or they'll see, um, you know, hear lions roaring at night time yeah. and be thankful for their presence here because the benefits are, are sort of far reaching and, and it is sort of getting that, I suppose. You're never going to, I think that sort of absolute harmony is, I think, impossible to achieve in any relationship, yeah. even the, the best of marriages yeah, or the, the happiest of families. It's not 100% just a wish. harmonious. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a, I suppose it's a, a dream in that, many ways. Yeah, maybe um, one day it will come to pass. But I think, yeah, just sort of for people to not just um, value the sort of the revenue or the, 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 the money that wildlife can bring, but I think for the sort of you know cultural mm. importance and traditional importance to sort of for that to be part of your your world, but almost part of your community are, you know, just not just the people, but the, the animals that you live alongside. Yeah. yeah. My next stop was to visit Andrew Makwati, a community guardian with Wild Crew. He's adapted traditional practices to create modern kraals, enclosures that are designed to protect cattle and other livestock from predators. So Andrew, you were involved in building Ah, well, not just this crawl, but every crawl that's been built by Wild Crew. Yes. Yeah, this is what we call permanent crawl. Mm -hmm. As you can see, we have standing posts and crossing posts. So the meaning of them is to make the crawl to be, get stronger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the diamond mesh, this one, we call it diamond mesh. Yeah, so it's, t it's untouched with cross posts and standing posts, mm -hmm. so to make it stronger. Yeah. So the, the, the purpose of the crossing posts is to make sure that the cattle who are inside, so they don't make the damage or yeah. to push the, the diamond mesh wire outside. So we are having the corners there. Uh -huh. So in the corner, we like to strengthen it so much. So we have realized that when our cows or cattle are inside, when the predators come and visit them, so they make sure that they are going to squeeze in a one side. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why we are making the corners extra to be strong. strong. Yeah, extra, extra strong. strong. Yes. And with this structure, I think a lot of people think you're trying to keep out something like a, 
a lion or a leopard and think, well, I've been to a zoo and is, you have a big cage, but this is, this is just enough. It's a simple solution and it, it sort of stops those lions from getting into the cattle. It just makes it that little bit too difficult for them. Yes, I like this because we have completed this thing to Namibian side, so at Kwandu, so they have a project like this. So we've been there and then we back, back, back much there. So I like this cross. Since we, we started to make it, so we didn't have any attacks yeah, inside the cross. Amazing. Yeah, because even the lions or hyenas, they can come and visit it. So it's hard for them uh -huh. to, to, to get inside. Yeah. That's why I got almost four to five years doing this. Yeah. So we didn't have anything attack inside. Yeah. So that's why I like it. Results, that's sort of the numbers speak for itself. Yeah. And so there was obviously the first crawl that you built, number one, and you're up to what, over 70 now? Yes. Now we have almost over 71 crawls. So this is the seventh one. Yeah. As you can see them. Yeah. So they are working hard here, yeah. they are working well here. Well, it's a perfect, perfect solution yes. to a, a problem that I suppose that has gone back as long as people have had cattle yes. in areas where you've got predators, it's always been there. But it's amazing that you've solved that and yeah, there's no, been no loss of, yeah, loss of cattle. I mean, uh, how long for a crawl of this size, how long to build that or how big is your team and how long does it take? Yeah, for this crawl, it's two to three days. Yeah. yeah. So what I like with this cross or this this area, yeah, it was a hot spot for for lions here. Mm -hmm. uh, then then we target this area. So each every week uh, they were attacked by a lion inside the mm -hmm. cross. So when we come, then we tell them about our project, and then they started to to build our cross, so I want to tell you this side, ah, we have less, less yeah, yeah. attack. Yeah. So I think we have reduced to 90%. Yeah, well that's amazing. And I suppose you want to, you're trying to break, break the chain because if a lion was to walk through an area and get even just a one meal, one easy meal, next time he's feeling hungry, oh, I know where we can go. Yes. Whereas this, they come, this is too difficult and then move on. So it does break that sort of that behavior. So in many ways, I suppose people are learning about the lions and other animals and the way that they move, but also the lions are learning like, oh, well, this is not a place. There's things here we can eat, but it's, it's too much of a, a challenge. Yeah, it always happened when we started building this. Yeah, and then after building this, then the, we, the lions came here. Yeah, then they found, oh, the structure is strong. Then you go to the neighbor one to find out, you know, the structure is weak. That's why then they get attacked with those neighbors. Yeah. But after that, even them, they say, oh, no, 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 no. Even us now, you want your permanent <laughs> clothes. That's why maybe this area, we are having almost six of our permanent clothes, mm -hmm. world crew cross here. So that's why I was saying the conflict is low. Yeah. yeah even the farmers, they are happy. Good. Well, I suppose that's what it is, sort of, uh, sort of happiness, and I still suppose peace of, peace of mind, knowing that, yeah, this is it's, these events aren't happening, and obviously it's people's livelihoods, yes. um, you know, not losing losing livestock to, to predators, um, and and animals not making that association with, you know, with food and, mm. and people. So, uh, for your work, is this ongoing? Sort of, you know, is there people is there a hotline okay get Andrew and his team we need we need a crawl here yeah, thank you yeah 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 it's hotline <laughs> yeah so even people from other areas <laughs> they need us we say no 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 we are getting this by step by step we'll reach there so now we're having a good relationship with farmers and the community mm -hmm. all so they know us and they know how the, the job we are doing yeah. so they appreciate that so I'm telling you that now we are now popular. Yeah. yeah. They are calling us, they are calling us. My final stop in this episode is to Jess Isden. Jess is Wild Crew's head of project and for me perfectly tied together everything that the community and the project partners in Botswana had told me over the 40 hours I spent in their village. 
You've been here for six years. When you first arrived, what were you sort of what mission were you were you tasked with? <laughs> what was the, the ambition? Yeah. So I was um, I was already working in Botswana um, for another project, and I joined Wild Crew as the coexistence coordinator. Um, so specifically with the role of, of bringing a human wildlife conflict project. So Wild Crew had been conducting um, research on large predators across Kaza um, in Botswana and Zimbabwe particularly for a number of years um, and they wanted now in Botswana to step into the next um, realm of work which was particularly working with the communities in those conflict hotspot areas and those critical corridors that connect our protected areas, national parks. Mm -hmm. I'm a wildlife biologist, um, so stepping into the community and the human aspect of it and all of the social, um, social science side of it wasn't something that I was particularly familiar with at the time. Um, and, and it's a very political, um, a very deep felt conflict that people have um, with the wildlife here. So it was definitely it was definitely something I didn't step into lightly. Um, I realised from the beginning, I think, what sort of challenges we'd be up against. Um, but uh, it's, it's an absolutely critical part of conservation. We can't conserve unless we uh, work with the people and, and help the people that are suffering the negative consequences of that wildlife. Mm -hmm. Throughout every community, every, each country that I've visited, is that there's that cultural value. These animals haven't suddenly showed up, these communities haven't suddenly dropped from the sky. It, it's, I suppose in many ways what has changed is that it's, it's the power that communities now have and, mm -hmm. and how their voices can be, be heard and they can sort of have that sort of influence and there is an, an empowerment which seems to be sort of at the very heart of, of, sort of resolving some of these conflicts. Yeah, definitely. Look, I think we, we do have to recognise that, that, that there is a financial aspect to the coexistence story. Um, I think often the balance is tipped um, not in the favour of communities. You know, the losses that they suffer um, from living alongside these wildlife, whether it's livestock loss or, or crop loss or even just that, um, you know, feeling of fear that they're not free to walk around and collect bush products and things like that that does have a financial um, element to it as well. And that's, that's part of what the coexistence um, solutions have to address to, to tip that balance more in the community's favor. Um, but absolutely, I think, I think these communities, um, you know, they've lived with wildlife for generations and, and obviously things change over time. Um, the population is increasing, our, our agricultural footprint is increasing in these areas. Um, so that conflict might be a different form as it was before, but it's still a very acute um, issue that people, people deal with here. And a lot of these communities, like here in the Chobe Enclave, the, the, the tribes here are, are so closely connected to the wildlife. They're not separate from them. Um, the, the paramount chief here, his totem animal is an impala. Um, so, you know, that culturally, that, the wild animals here hold a very deep rooted um, tradition in people's lives. So it's not that communities and wildlife are against each other all the time, um, and they do see the values, but, but like everybody, we don't want them on our doorstep. We don't want a dangerous animal, you know, greeting us as we leave our homestead in the morning. There has to be um, a balance between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable when it comes to that danger. And the same then with the financial aspect of it. Um, but it's not, it's not at all that, that communities don't value the wildlife and the intrinsic values that they bring to them and even the monetary values that they bring to them. Um, but we wouldn't accept the level of conflict and, and tolerance um, that people have here for these wild animals. Um, and so I think we need to recognise that when we're thinking about conservation in, in places like this and recognise that we need to work towards a more balanced system. I'm sure there are many, many challenges with your job and your role, but having spoken to members of your team, there are sort of successes here. I think maybe I've got my own answer, opinion to this, this question, but what, what is the secret to the successes that, that you've had so far? Gosh, I mean, I think for our project in particular, time. Time has actually been probably one of the most things that I appreciate more now as we as we go on and, and it's still a relatively short period of time we've, we've had a project here for six years um, as you said you've met some of our team who are all people who have grown up and lived in these villages um, 
But, you know, we're, we're at a stage now over time where people really believe that we're actually invested in them and their future and, and their coexistence story. So when you first, when a project first comes in, especially an, an outside project, um, essentially like us, you know, the feeling is, well, you'll be here for a few years and then you'll leave and our lives will go back to how they were before. And it's only really over time, um, you know, in keeping on showing up and keeping on greeting um, the community and having um, our guardians out on patrol on a daily basis, that I think you can build that, that true trusting relationship with the community. And then you can start to talk to them about bigger, more ambitious ideas. Um, if we'd come in at the beginning and had, you know, said, oh, well, we want to revolutionise the way that you farm your cattle, for example, um, we wouldn't have been taken seriously. So I think, I think that longevity and that, that true partnership with the community, not just a project that's coming in and being imposed and then um, leaving after a short period of time, but saying, OK, no, we, 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 if, if everything falls into place correctly, we want to be here for the next 10, 20 years and, and join you in this um, journey that you're on towards coexistence, mm. whatever that might look like in five or 10 or 20 years time. Yeah. Um, we want to be here. Uh, yeah, it feels very much as it is a, a partnership with local people and having these mm. spokespeople, your community guardians that mm. can sort of be the amplifiers and the sort of go between and, and sort of help try and solve some of those issues. I mean, uh, talking about predators of beyond this um, Chobe Enclave, the, the Trans Kalahari, the Trans Kalahari Predator Program is is that sort of a similar concept in other parts of, um, of Southern Africa or across the Kalahari? Yeah, so the, the Trans Kalahari Predators Programme is one of many programmes under Wild Crew, um, which is part of the University of Oxford. And it's, um, it's particularly a, a research based programme that looks at um, the connectivity, the movement um, of large predators. So most people think that we only focus on lions, but actually, we, you know, our interest is in most of the large um, predators that we get in this area in the Kaza landscape. Um, and we're particularly interested in, in the connectivity between those pre pre protected areas um, and looking at how animals move between them because most of our large predators, they need that dispersal. Um, they, they're not isolated units that live in national parks and you know that we might see on television and think, well, that's where they live and it's beautiful and, and everything's comfortable. Um, particularly young males, they have to disperse through the environment um, to find uh, other, other territories um, for that genetic diversity and that resilience of those predators into the future. We need that genetic movement um, in the population. Mm. And we're, we're right in the middle here of one of the, the strongest contiguous um, lion strongholds um, and other predators too. So making sure that those habitats don't become too fragmented um, is particularly what, what we're about. So we do a lot of um, modeling of what will happen in future scenarios with climate change, with um, agriculture and, and human expansion, um, infrastructural things. You know, if we're going to build a railway through an area, we can even model what the impact of that might have on the connectivity of those species. Um, and that's what helps us then identify what we call these critical corridors. And these are the corridors often which include community areas like this or livestock rearing areas where we don't necessarily, we're not saying that we want predators to live in these areas, but they have to be able to move between them. So we talk about things like um, permeable landscapes where, where those predators can move through relatively safely and not causing negative impacts for the communities that are living in those areas. And that's what our coexistence program is, is essentially based on. Um, we're not telling people here that they have to love these animals. They have to live with them on their doorsteps every day. But we do need these areas to be permeable to them so that we can connect the protected areas that we're, we're completely surrounded here in the Chobe Enclave by yeah. wildlife protected areas. I get a real sense, I've seen and heard how local people are working together as a community. They're working with um, other authorities, people from outside Botswana to solve these issues. I think when people come together, you can't expect harmony or absolute harmony, but I think everyone is on the same page. Everyone has the same 
desire. I think most people see that there are benefits to living alongside wildlife, but that's very hard to convince anyone that there's any benefit to living alongside wildlife, wild animals if they've lost uh, a loved one. And I think that's only to be expected. There's been a lot of talk of, of education, of, of learning, animals learning from people, you know, how we move, how, what are our requirements from this landscape. But there's also this desire for people to learn from the wildlife and to pass on that learning, to educate other people in this area with the ultimate goal to being coexistence where you just minimize the, the conflict where you limit the harm that's done to communities, when you try and prevent the loss of livelihood and the loss of, of life. So it's everyone is working together with this single mission, simply to overcome the challenge that comes with coexistence. If you'd like to hear the audio version of this episode, just search Beneath the Baobab on your preferred podcast app or follow the links below the video. JAMA International are passionate about conservation and well-being for people and planet, and know it's crucial to open positive dialogue and share ideas. We'd love you to share this video. Please do so with the hashtag beneath the Baobab on social media, or maybe just start a conversation with a friend. Next time in Beneath the Baobab, we travel over the border to Botswana and we find out how the role of organisations and the implementation of innovative methods can aid the coexistence of people and animals. I'm Gordon Buchanan. Thanks for watching. <laughs>